The sermon that I'm going to give today is very different than I normally give, but it was just such an interesting subject that when I began to study it, Kenny, I don't think I'm hitting the right down button. There we go. It was, um, it was just such an interesting subject, I thought I would give it to you. I normally don't give these kind of sermons, but it was fascinating to me, so I think it might be fascinating to you. In Genesis 1, verse 2, we read, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving or hovering on the face of the waters. Now this is the great inspired creation epic that begins the book of Genesis, that begins the entire scriptures. And it begins in a world that has been thrown into chaos and darkness. Wind is blowing without any obstruction over the face of what we might call the primordial waters. There's nothing to stop it. It's dark. Everything is in confusion. Now, all ancient cultures, all ancient cultures have a creation epic that helps them to understand the world that they live in. That is, the creation epic in ancient cultures help them understand what is called the cosmological order. In other words, how they understood the world, how they understood it, and how they tried to make sense of the world in which they live. Why is the world the way it is? Now, as you read through Genesis, it becomes very apparent that Moses understood that the cultures of his day had their own particular cosmological view that they derived from their own creation epics. And he also understood that their cosmological view of the world, that is how they saw the world, was an impediment and kept them from seeing who was and who was not God. Moses, Moses his, his goal was to establish in Genesis who is God and who is not God. That is his primary goal in writing Genesis. Genesis is more about who God is rather than how God created. He's not trying to describe how God created per se. He's trying to tell us who the creator is in contrast with the pagan deities that the people of his day worshipped. We see in Genesis, again, 1 verse 2, it says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We see that all through Scripture, the image of water is spoken of. And here in Genesis, we see it as in a period of confusion. We see it described as the deep. The Hebrew word for the deep here is tehol. Now, tehol was in the cultures of that day. Tehol was the great adversary of God. The great adversary of God that existed prior to the creation of the earth. And it was Tehol who brought on the confusion in the chaotic state that we see in Genesis. Tehol became known as the power of the world. And that Tehol resided in the deep, that is, within the waters. Tehol is also closely associated with the pagan deity Tiamat. And Tiamat was a dragon-type deity that brought chaos, disorder, and destruction. It was symbolized by a dragon, and Tiamat was thought or believed to spawn other sea creatures, other dragons. Now, in many of the ancient cultures, it was believed that evil, that is, demonic or satanic powers, were found within water, or bodies of water, particularly the sea that if you were going to encounter demonic powers, it would be upon the ocean. Now, that belief, that idea, passed down through the generations, and you see it even surfacing in the stories of seafarers encountering sea serpents and other malevolent spirits upon the water. Now, understanding this cosmology, that is how they viewed the world, understanding that they believed that is, from Genesis to Revelation, that the cultures that we see encountered in the scriptures believe that demonic powers existed in the water gives us an understanding of many of the things that we read in scripture. From Genesis clear to Revelation chapter 13, where the beast, that is the personification of the world system, emerges out of the waters, meaning that its source is demonic, benevolent. 
is Tiamat, Tihon, the adversaries of God from the beginning. Even at the onset of the inspired creation of Genesis, we see God, though, bringing order out of the disorder. That in spite of the power of the world, as Tihon or Tiamat, God brings order and sets things right in the middle of disorder and chaos. The patriarch Job speaks of God's power over Tihon, or the waters. We see that in Genesis 7. I mean, excuse me. We see that in Job chapter 9, verse 8, where Job says, speaking of God, he alone stretched out the heavens and he treads on the waves of the sea. That is, God is above the powers of the world. That God rules over them. That God controls them. That God's power is superior. That his sovereignty is above them. We also see this in Job chapter 38 verse 11. Where Job writes, speaking of God, he, and, Job, and Job writing the question of God to humanity. He says, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garments and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed the limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this is as far as you come and no, no further. You see, God is saying, I rule. I'm the creator. You see, he's not just speaking about the oceans, that is, the sea, the bodies of water. He's talking about the powers that are thought to dwell therein. That God rules. God determines how far the powers of this world can go and cannot go. God's sovereignty, God's throne, God's power is over any and all things. He sets the limits. He is God. He brings order. He brings light into darkness. He sets right chaos. You see, these are the things that only God can do in spite of those things that the world and the powers behind the world system may do. We see that people in the ancient world worshipped many things, even as they do today. The people of Egypt worshipped the Nile River, as well as other gods. Each of the plagues that God visited upon Egypt were demonstrating who is God and who is not. That is, that God was striking the things that the people of Egypt worshipped showing his superiority over them, that they are the created and that he is the creator. He's showing the people of Israel who God is and who it isn't. And as a result, the people of Israel were ultimately set free. We see the plagues that God visited upon Egypt outlined in Exodus chapter 7, verses 14 to 25, up to Exodus 12, verse 36 where God shows that He is God. Again, the plagues result in the freeing of the people of Israel and their journey to the Red Sea. Now, why would God lead His people to the shores of the Red Sea? You see, God had a purpose for taking people, His people, to an impasse, a body of water that stood between them and freedom while their enemies pursued them. There is a reason why God takes Israel to the Red Sea. The power of Tihon, that is the power of the world, was associated with the Red Sea. And now it is the Red Sea that stands between Israel and freedom. And it is the Red Sea that God parts, shows his power, his sovereignty over showing that the powers of this world cannot stop God from delivering you, delivering me. So when you're facing an impasse in life, when you're dealing with chaos and crises in your life, and there seems to be an impasse in your way, God has the power to open a way that not all the power of the world can stop him from delivering you in whatever trial you face. You see, that's what God is trying to show Israel and trying to show you and I through the pages of Scripture. The powers of this world, the power of Tihon, cannot stop God from delivering you. 
he reigns over it. In Psalm 33, verses 6 to 8, the psalmist wrote, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the water of the sea, tea home, into jars, and he puts the deep, and the Hebrew word there is yam, into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. Again, you see, God gathers the water of Tehol. That is the power behind the world. He contains it. He controls it. He limits it. That is that the powers that might assail you in life, the powers that stand between you and deliverance in whatever circumstance or condition you're in, God has the power over it. God has the power to set the limits of what the world can do to you, do to me, do to his people around the world. Again, God is establishing his power over the chaotic spiritual forces of this world. He limits what they can do and what they cannot do. Psalm 89, verse 9, speaks of God's power to bring order. Where we read, you rule over the surging sea when its waves mount up. You still them. That is that God can come into the midst of the turbulence of your life and bring peace. He can still the storms in your life. He can bring quiet and calm into the disorder that you and I may periodically experience. You see, he's not just talking about the waves of the sea. He's talking about your life. The waves of your life, the stormy moments when things seem so uncertain. He has the power to deliver you, to remove the impasses, to calm the storms that you might face. Even the disciples of Jesus, even the disciples of Jesus, there upon the Sea of Galilee, as Jesus walks upon the waters and then storms, uh, quiets the storm upon Galilee, the Sea of Galilee didn't recognize Jesus. Even as he approached them and as they respond to his approach upon the sea, they describe him as a ghost. Why would they describe Jesus as a ghost? That response comes out of their cosmological order, how they viewed the world. If you were going to encounter a demonic power, it would be upon a body of water. And there in the darkness, in the midst of their storm, they interpret Jesus entering into the situation as something benevolent. You see, that view came out of their own view of the world. They didn't recognize Jesus. Yet even in the midst of all of that, Jesus Christ brings order, brings peace. We can read of Jesus calming the seas in Matthew 8, and then again in Matthew 14. You see, Jesus was showing, walking on the water, that he has power above the power of the world. You see, that's what he's really demonstrating, that he is above it. He rules over it. It has no power to touch him. He can bring peace to it. He's not just making a spectacle. He's making a statement as to who he is and his sovereignty. He's above the turbulence of this world and the forces that spawn it. Jesus rules, not Tehom or Tiamat. The two principal deities that created the chaos and the primordial mess. You see, Jesus rules He's above all the storms that we might face in our life. They have no power over him. In Matthew 8, verse 22, we read that when Jesus gets into the boat, or rather he's, we're told that he, that is Jesus, got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake, that is the Sea of Galilee, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping, and his disciples went and woke him up and said, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. And he replied,